Jesus said, I am the resurrection and I am life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, yet they shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I hold the keys of hell and death. Because I live, you also shall live. Friends, we have gathered here today to praise God and to witness to our faith as we celebrate the life of John Hazen White III. We come together in grief, acknowledging our human loss. May God grant us grace that in pain we may find comfort, in sorrow, hope, and in death, resurrection. I invite all those who are able to stand and join with us in singing our opening hymn, Jesus Loves Me. You may be seated. May the Lord be with you. Let us pray. Let us join together in this unison prayer, sharing with one another. Eternal God, your love for us is everlasting. You alone can turn the shadow of death into the brightness of morning light. Help us to turn to you with believing hearts. In the stillness of this hour, speak to us of eternal things, so that hearing the promises in Scripture, we may have hope and be lifted above our distress into the peace of your presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes to us from the book of Ecclesiastes, and I'll be reading from the third chapter beginning with the first verse, and I invite you now to hear these eternal words. For everything there is a season, a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill 
and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. This ends our reading. I'd also like to invite you at this time to join with me in sharing the 23rd Psalm, which should be included in your bulletin as well, as we share this together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me by the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Our epistle lesson this morning comes to us from John's Revelation, and I share with you the 21st chapter beginning with the first verse. And again, I invite you to hear now these words. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, The home of God is among mortals. God will dwell with them and be their God. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more for the first things will have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See? I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. Those who conquer will inherit these things, and I will be their God and they will be my children. This ends our reading. At this time, I would like to invite Matt Barrows to come forward, a childhood friend of John's, to share with us his thoughts. How does someone pay tribute to a guy like John White? He had a personality that was larger than life. The second he walked into a room, it lit up like a Christmas tree. Everything that came out of his mouth was hilarious, even if he didn't mean it to be that way. It was just the way he was. Whether he was reciting lines from planes, trains, and automobiles, telling you an inappropriate joke, or just remarking about something that happened to him during a recent business trip, you were guaranteed to have a good laugh. I can tell you from experience of knowing him for 35 years that John has been the same since we were kids. Always laughing, playing jokes, 
Mm. Having a good time. Growing up, we walked the neighborhood streets with fake rifles hunting aliens. <laughs> we hung Ben's underwear on the flagpole <laughs> after watching Salute Your Shorts on Nickelodeon. Spent Thursday nights watching East Ventura way too many times. We snuck around and listened to the Jerky Boys well before we should have been allowed to. And we ate so many Domino's pizzas, extra cheese light on the sauce. John also once performed an onion ring transplant at the dinner table at Applebee's that my father still talks about to this day. John, of course, was always the ringleader during all this mischief, but I gladly followed him. Some of our mischief as kids was at Ben's expense. Sorry, Ben. <laughs> Which, of course, is typical for kids with their younger siblings. But as we got older, John and Ben's bond was very strong. They were not brothers, but best friends. And they are the brothers I never had. We've had many nights of laughter and fun together as adults, going to concerts, each other's weddings, and almost every 4th of July celebration with our growing families. We still have caused our share of mischief here and there, but mostly have had a lifetime of laughter. We have John to thank for those memories. Anyone who spent time at John's house for a get-together of any kind, you're sure to have at least one of the following things occur. A viewing of Carlito, a short film John made with his classmates in high school, a reenactment of, of one, at least one scene from one of his favorite movies, and a live performance of Mr. Bojangles. This all accompanied by a steak meal, burgers on the grill, or a Doritos casserole. If you're lucky, you got to see all that at least once. I spent countless nights with many friends and family of his doing that. And boy, if we had a lot of laughs. <sighs> to say he was a people person was an understatement. He absolutely loved people, meeting new people, talking to people he already knew, <clears throat> and learning new things about them. He was an awesome salesman and was so passionate about his family company he was so proud to be a member of the White family and the Takeo family. He was proud to be a part of an American company and frequently boasted about that. And speaking of America, he sure was proud to be an American. He was not afraid to speak his mind about how much America meant to him either. He stood up for what he believed in and he always stood up for who he believed in. He always had the back of people who he cared about, including myself, cheering me on and being someone to lean on when I needed him. He was truly one of a kind. I remember when he told me he was first dating Kate and how excited he was to have reconnected with her after meeting her so many years ago. I had pretty much known, after we all got together for the first time, she was the one. The way she looked at him was so special. She laughed at all his jokes and they just had so much fun together. I felt so happy that he had found his person. Before we knew it, we were both engaged to be married. Mm. In January 2017, he stood by my side as my best man as I married my wife. And in true John fashion, he gave the most unbelievable speech you could ever imagine. He jokingly said he had started writing it as a teenager, and I don't think he was joking. <laughs> because it was just amazing. Later that same year in October, I stood with him as he married the love of his life, Caitlin. Fast forward a few years, and we both walk into our babies. Our boy Henry, who John will be, the one and only to call Hank. In August, in Madison the following April. We talked multiple times about becoming fathers, and how unbelievable it was to go from being those two guys hunting aliens, <laughs> to having kids of our own. We talked a lot about all the things we were going to do together, with our kids as they grew up and the adventures they would have, just like we did. I stand here now and make a promise to you, John. I will see those things through and make sure that I carry on the traditions we started with our kids and make sure... Henry, Maddie, and Winnie get into plenty of mischief 
I also promise to help your family and take care of Kate and Madison always. Now, I know John wanted to me to be up here blubbering like a complete fool. <laughs> so before that starts, I want to wrap this up. To the best son, husband, father, brother, and friend anyone could have ever had. I hope you're in paradise, the most beautiful piano bar, sitting on an old wagon wheel, doing the mess around with John Candy himself. <laughs> and that little dog Winston is sitting on your lap, and you're telling everyone all about the last 35 years of this amazing ride of life that you were on. I hope they all know how lucky they are to have you with them for the next adventure. We all love you so much, John. We will spend the rest of our lives missing you until we meet again. I would also like to invite Bart Taroni, a dear family friend, to come forward and share his thoughts with us as well. Matt, that was excellent. That was very special. Well, it came from your heart. And that's the most important thing about him, about John. Good morning, everyone. As we gather today to celebrate the life of John Hazen White III, we all are fraternal. As we share the pain of enduring such a tremendous and unexpected loss to a wonderful human being. And the husband father, son, brother, nephew, son-in-law. He was all those things. But to all of us, whether we're here in Rhode Island or watching all over the world, he was also part of our families, all of us. And we love him dearly for that. He just made all of us better people for his being a part of our lives. That is a gift, and we are blessed to know him. When asked by Johnny to speak today, the tragedy that we all experienced initially prevented me to have any real lucid thoughts. It was like, I don't even know what to say. What do you say? on such a horrific event. But the more I thought about it, the more I thought about John, the person, the kind of man that he was, it became very easy for me to identify the qualities that he exhibited throughout his entire life. Respectful, genuine, authentic, compassionate, and intelligent. And I'm talking wicked smart intelligent. <laughs> and the most of all, the one thing that meant the most to John was family. We as individuals, we strive to achieve these qualities I just mentioned to you throughout our entire lives. He achieved them at a very young age, a truly special man. I've been fortunate to have been part of the White and Taco families for many years and also had the opportunity to see a young boy grow into a man. I saw how he would walk into Taco with his coworkers during the summer from the floor and, and at both Cranston Street and Fall River. He was one of them. The respect and camaraderie that he had for those people was very obvious to everyone. They were family. The bond that he developed with his brother Benjamin. 
as they became older was unparalleled, truly genuine and authentic. He was family. Upon graduating from college, he followed in the same path as his father when he went to work for a manufacturer's rep to learn the business from that perspective. He came to Philadelphia and worked with our team at BJ Tironi Company in the years 2012 and 2013 before returning to Rhode Island to continue his career at Takeo. During his time with us, he just simply endeared himself to everyone at our organization and made a lasting impression on all of us. Just as he did during the summers with the people that he worked with on the floor. He made all our people even more a part of the White and Takeo families and that feeling has not left any of us in Philadelphia to this very day. The bond that was created over 10 years ago was created by a relatively very young man. That's how special he was. He was just being himself with a smile, his laugh, and he had a good one, and his propensity to hug everyone. Man. <laughs> But you know, he was part of our family too when he was with us. He was part of our family. I know that John was known at Takeo by J3, and I'm sure many others called him J3. Everyone called him that. Well, in Philadelphia, he was known as the Hammer. <laughs> <laughs> you know this. And that was for his propensity of nailing down the, the order, whether it be with a wholesale distributor to purchase more residential products for their inventory to promote the brand, or on a commercial project specifying Takeo with an engineer and then securing the order with the mechanical contractor. He was that intelligent that he was able to have that kind of success in such a short period of time on both the residential and the commercial portions of our business. Wicked smart. His love for Takeo and his family just beamed through him, permeated through him. It motivated him. He just loved doing it. And you know, he did it his way. He really did with all those qualities that we have already discussed. The time he spent with us, the bond that he created and developed with all of us will never be forgotten. I will always call him the hammer, and I always have, and he always called me Uncle Barty. <laughs> it was just him being him, and you know what, that's, that's okay with me. He can call me Uncle Barty, it's okay. Not too many people can do that. <laughs> but his persona was truly genuine, truly genuine. When I read his obituary that was sent by Takeo and published in the Providence Journal, I knew he had a passion for everything that was listed, especially the creative writing, because I remember that when he came to Philadelphia. I also learned that he enjoyed cooking and was a student of history, which I did not know. Since I didn't know that when he came, first came to Philadelphia, so naturally, my nephew Bart and I we're going to show him the sights of Philly. So we take him to Independence Hall, we take him to visit the Liberty Bell. And since he is such a connoisseur of food, we take him to the first restaurant in Philly, Pat Steaks, <laughs> down in South Philly. First place we went. So we get to, I had to teach him how to properly order a cheese steak since he's never had one. And if anybody's been down there, you have to, you have to order it properly. So if you want a cheese steak with fried onions, you have to say, you want cheese steak with, cheese steak with. <laughs> I think he got that. It was pretty easy for him to get. But he was very confused when he arrived. He, 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 he comes to this corner on, on 9th and Street in, in South Philadelphia, and he, he looks at me and he says, we can't eat inside? I said, John, it's South Philadelphia. No, you're going to eat outside and you're going to like it, so suck it up, man. <laughs> so, of course, we stand in the middle of 9th Street. 
at the base of the Italian market with all the ethnic, you know, the, the ethnic around him. And he is just looking around. He's no place to sit down or be inside. He survived the ordering process, so when he went to the window to order his cheesesteak, he didn't get thrown at the back of the line, because if you don't order properly, they throw you at the back of the line. They're very charming, endearing people down there. <laughs> but you know, when he finished his sandwich, he just looked at me and he said, Barty, that was great. <laughs> and I just looked back on that and I say, truly authentic, just truly authentic. Oh, then we go to, to see the Liberty Bell, of course. So then we go in town, so we go to the Liberty Bell. And then off to Independence Hall we go. So as the tour guide is speaking, so we take the tour of, of the facility, the tour guide is speaking to everybody uh, there about the framing of our Declaration of Independence, its founding fathers. J3 is just minding his own business, but he's staring up into space. Looking around, looking at the floor. I'm saying, what's this guy doing? Then he whispers in my ear. He says, Uncle Barty. I said, yeah. He goes, how many take go pumps do you think are in this place? <laughs> <laughs> truly priceless, truly priceless. So when he was looking around, I realized when he was looking around, he's looking, he's following the piping. He's following the piping in the building. So when I think back to the time he was with us, the dinners we had with his brother and his dad in the small little Italian place in, in Germany during the Ish show, I realize how precious our time is here in this life. For this young man to leave us too early makes it hard for all of us to comprehend. We need to pull from each other the strength to get through this. That's what families do. We need each other. Caitlin and Madison, all of us here and those watching are a part of you. We are your family. We are. Please know that all of us will help you get through this, as I'm sure you will also help us get through it. You're not alone. I told you that last night. You are not alone and you never will be. May the grace of God be with you always and the fond memory of John forever in your heart. My deepest condolences to you, the White and the Zerba families. May we all live our lives with the quality that J3 exemplified. Perhaps it would be a blessing to all of us if we were a little bit more like him. I'd now like to invite Reverend Jeff Larson to come forward and share our remarks today. Jeff is the former pastor, senior minister here at the Barrington Congregational Church, a dear friend of the White family, and has known John for quite some time. Nice. Nice words, you two. Beautiful. <clears throat> In the eighth chapter of the book of Luke, Jesus is going from town to town. He's teaching different lessons, and the people are just all over him. They're following him. They're listening to him. They are starving for some answers to some serious questions. And at that particular moment, he tells a story, a parable. And he said there was a sower, a farmer, who went out one morning to sow his seed. And as he scattered that seed, some of it, he said, fell 
along the trail, along the path, and it got trodden underfoot, and the birds of the air came and they ate it. And some of that seed, he said, fell on the rocks, and it withered, and it died, and it produced nothing. Some of the seed fell on the thorns, and when the plants came up, they intertangled with the thorns and amounted to no good. He said some of that seed fell in the fertile soil, and the seed that fell in the fertile mm. soil multiplied a hundredfold. This morning I am so struck by the fact that six days ago I stood up in front of a full church and officiated at the funeral of a dear friend who was 99 years old. And there was some crying that day and there were questions that day. But throughout the whole church there was a sense that we understand this. This makes sense. This is the natural way. The fellow had chosen some of his own readings, some of his own music, and I knew that day that my job was simply stand up and celebrate life. And everybody there was in the same spirit. This is very different. <clears throat> to come here to be with the family of a, a young man, a young husband, a young father, a young son, a young brother is not natural. And there's not a one of us that easily rolls the word celebration of life off our tongues. And there's a lot of questions about why. <clears throat> I've been doing this minister thing for about 50 years. I've officiated at over 600 funerals. I have thought a whole lot about why for a long time. And I have an answer. It may not be your answer, because I do believe that each of us has our own answer to that question. Each of us has to come to our own understanding about what this day is and what it means and, and how we handle it and where we go forward. John died because his body could no longer handle the stresses that have been put upon it. And we all put stresses on our body. When you're old like me, you, you think about it a lot, and you worry about it, and you do something about it. Spend half your life going to the doctor. But when you're young, you don't think about that. You don't believe that you need to worry about those things. John died because we have not perfected humanity yet. We have not cured all the diseases that are out there. We haven't created a world in which there's no war. We haven't all come to realize that we have to share our things so that nobody needs to die of starvation. And I told Kate the other day, and I absolutely believe this, God cried along with each and every one of us when John took that last breath. There were many times in the process of these last weeks that the family had great hope. John would be battling one thing and he would, he would fight it like blazes. All his strength, all his, and the prayers and all the power behind them. And he would seem to overcome that and he'd seem to get better. And then boom, something else would break down. And, and it was just one, as you said, yes, just this over and over and over again. And the ultimate miracle that they prayed for did not happen. But God 
had to accept into God's care this too young man too soon and gave him the final ultimate freedom from that struggle that he's not in the midst of anymore. He's free from the diseases that overtook his body and God absolutely is hoping with all God's might that we will find ways to keep that from happening to other people. We are here today, <clears throat> and I love the way Matt and, uh, said it, just we're, we're here today because John lived, and the way he lived, and the, and the energy and the love and the passion that he had. And God is hoping that we figure out a way to make that change all of our lives so that this doesn't have to happen again. In the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, <clears throat> up on the second floor in one of the rooms is this huge painting of the sower. And it, the guy in the painting looks like John. He's a big fellow and he's, he's burly and he has that energy and that passion and he's digging into his sack and he's just scattering the seed all over the place. It's a beautiful, beautiful painting. There's life to it. And, and John was a sower. John scattered that seed everywhere. And some of it fell in the rocks. And some of it fell in the thorns. And from the sounds of things, some of you were those thorns. <laughs> <clears throat> but boy, did John produce a hundredfold in the fertile soil that he found in so many of you. His life was full of production, full of, of the, the fertile soil, just grew and grew, and you have so many memories about that. Just read the, uh, the, uh, the website and all the stories of all, some of you probably added those stories. The number of times when his life changed one of you and he stepped in in some small, some gentle way and turned things around. He loved life. And he loved people and he loved caring about people. He had the biggest heart in the entire world. And the biggest miracle did not happen that you prayed for. But together today, we pray that through you, another miracle will happen. Another miracle of goodness and caring will continue to grow. You know, we don't come here today to say, okay, it's done, goodbye, it's over. We come here today to say, John, we're gonna take a piece of you into our heart. A piece of who you were, a piece of what you did a piece of how you lived, and we are going to make sure that you continue to live so that his little girl will continue to know him through each and every one of us. We are here today because John lived, and we're here today to make sure he continues to do that. So my prayer for each and every one of you is that you find, you find a piece of John and you take that inside and you promise to Kate and to all the family that you're gonna make John's energy and his, his smile and his passion just continue to sow and continue to produce. Then his life would it be worthwhile? God bless you, all of you. Thank you, Jeff. Beautiful words. Let us pray. 
everlasting God. In Christ's resurrection, you turned the disciples' despair into triumph, their sorrow into joy. Give us faith to believe that every good that seems to be overcome by evil and every love that seems to be buried in death shall rise again to life eternal through Jesus Christ who lives and reigns with you forevermore. O God, all that you have given us is already yours. As first you gave John to us, so now we give him back to you. Receive him into the arms of your mercy. Raise him up with all of your people. Receive us also and raise us into a new life. And help us so to love and serve you in this world that we may enter into your joy in the world to come. O God of love, we thank you for all with which you have blessed us with, even to this day. For the gift of joy in the days of health and strength, and for the gifts of your abiding presence and promise in days of pain and grief. We praise you for home and friends, for our baptism and a place in your church with all who have faithfully lived and died. Above all else, we thank you for Jesus, who knew our griefs, who died our death and rose for our sake, and who lives and prays for each of us. As he taught us, so now may we pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive those, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hearing you all with trespasses brought me back to my Methodist roots for a moment. <laughs> congregation will laugh at the day I said, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who debt against us, whatever that means. One of the requests from the White family was that we laugh a little today, that we rejoice today that we celebrate today as hard as it is, as each of our speakers have shared, both the laughter, the joy, the happiness, and the tears that we all feel today. Our opening hymn and our closing hymn were both picked out by the White family in an effort to help us to smile, in an effort to remind us of the eternal promises, the eternal hope, and the eternal joy. And so I invite all of us, especially those who are able to stand and join as we sing our closing hymn, Joyful, Joyful.
Before I dismiss us today, I would just like to once again share the invitation for everyone who is here to join with the White family down at the Rhode Island Country Club. I believe directions are included in the program today. They would love to take that opportunity to share stories with you, to laugh, to rejoice, to share one of John's great hugs, whatever it is. They would love to see you all there. And so may the joy of life that was such a part of who John was and the love and care and compassion he had for others that lived so fully in his life be a part of your life this day. And may God bless you on your way as you minister and care to one another. Thank you.